All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Bears Guide 205. Today, we're talking about international and supranational organizations. Now, we have talked a lot about countries falling apart, countries fighting, devolution, balkanization, splitting up, autonomy, all that. We're going to talk about now and explore the ideas of countries coming together and working together. So, as I mentioned, while countries are arguing and devolutions happening and border disputes are happening, some other countries are doing the opposite. Internationalism is an idea between countries, between nations, working together for something, right? And this is the first thing we have to talk about, international organizations. It's an organization made up of two or more states working together for a specific objective. We are going to come together and we're going to accomplish one goal. Here are some examples. Oh, sorry. Here's First off, we have the UN. A lot of people recognize the We have OPEC. We have NATO, and most of you are thinking, okay, I don't know what these things are. So, all of these organizations, these three specific ones, and there's plenty of others, they all have a purpose, right? Um, you could even break it down to speed, social, political, economic, environmental, and demographic. What is their purpose? So the UN is a political part of speed. It's a political agreement between countries to keep peace throughout the world. That is their one objective. Now, they've grown into other stuff with economics and health and the environment and development, but their main goal, their first goal, was to keep peace, right? That was their original thing. NATO, on the other hand, is a military treaty where uh, it was originally created during the Cold War, but now it's a military agreement between countries that we would defend each other. And then OPEC is the economic part of SPEED. It's the organization of petroleum exporting countries. So basically it's an economic organization where they agree on oil prices to benefit those countries as most as possible. So there are other examples that fall especially into SPEED, like there are social international organizations, there are economic international organizations, environmental, and we'll talk more about those later. Now, supranationalism is a little bit different than international, international organizations. So sometimes working together for one specific objective isn't enough. So they turn to this even, I don't want to say extreme form of working together, but a more serious form of working together. Supranationalism happens when three or more states form an organization that are above their individual states, and we'll explore what that means, and they come together for shared goals. There's multiple purposes behind this organization, and there's really only one you need to know. So before we go into the examples and specifics, once again, you have to understand that this organization they create out of supranationalism, it exists above the individual nations. It is stronger than the individual nations, and they focus on more than one thing. The best example, and really the only example you should ever use, is the European Union. Now there is the African Union, and we will talk about them, but if you ever get a question, you should really just use the EU. So the European Union is the best example of a supranational organization. Now, the reason why it's considered supranational, there are lots of reasons. The EU controls things about society, about politics, about economics, about the environment, about demographic changes, all that stuff. But one of the best things they have done for Europe is connecting all of those countries on one currency, the euro, because before they all had individual currencies. And we'll talk more about that in class. Who uses the euro? Obviously, it's a majority of European countries, which makes traveling a lot easier. It makes the um, economics and trade between countries a lot easier to happen when they all use one currency. So aside from the euro, uh, the EU has had other impacts that you need to know. Really, the, there's three major impacts you have to know about the EU. The first one being that it created a currency for all countries to use. Second, the EU has eliminated tariffs. That's taxes. So there's no taxes on trade between countries. So if you're an EU country and your next door neighbor's an EU country, well, now you can trade for free, which stimulates the economy of both countries. Also, it eliminated border crossings within the EU. That means there's no checkpoints or places where you have to show your passport or get your car checked. If you're traveling from EU country to EU country, you can travel as if you're traveling from state to state in the US. So now, goods and people can move faster and more efficiently and unite these countries together and work together. And here's an example of what a border crossing looks like in Europe. Like, there's just a sign. There's nothing else. You just go through. 
But remember, while this is great and it's fantastic that these countries can now move people around faster, get more money around faster and trade faster, and we'll explore these topics more in class, we have to remember that the EU is stronger than the individual states. So when joining the EU, member states have to give up certain rights in exchange for membership. It's like you're giving up this thing. In return, you get all the benefits. And what is this thing? What are these rights? What's that vocab word? And that would be their sovereignty. So they're giving up some sovereignty to join them. For an example, um, you don't have to write this down, but to talk about how powerful the EU is and what they do, there was they, they made a rule about light bulbs. They said that the old peach-colored 60-watt light bulbs, the incandescent or ir incandescent, yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, they restricted the sale of those because they're not environmentally friendly. They're not energy efficient. They said that all EU countries must use, you know, fluor uh, LED and fluorescent bulbs. And people in Britain are like, that's ridiculous. I should be able to use whatever light bulb I want. But by joining the EU, they gave up the sovereignty on that rule. Or, for example, vacuum cleaners. The EU banned a certain type of vacuum cleaner that used too much electricity. And they got rid of that. So people are very critical of the EU because they seem like overreaching and taking away silly parts of sovereignty. But at the same time, there's so many benefits with being part of the EU. So always remember, in essence, by joining the EU or any supranational organization, people are going to give up their right to govern their internal or external affairs. They're giving up some sovereignty to be a part of this. So the question is, is it worth giving up some sovereignty to be a part of something like this? And we'll talk more about Brexit and the first country to ever leave the EU. Um, it's still going on. It has been a thing happening over the past three, four years. Um, and we'll just explore more of it in class. So what do you need to know today? Um, a lot of stuff was thrown at you in the seven minutes. But essentially, you have to know the difference between international, organization, inter the, the, international organizations and supranational organizations. You have to understand what countries give up in order to join a supranational organization. And then explain some of the benefits of joining a supranational organization like the European Union. What were those three things that we went over? We'll explore more, top, more about this in class. If you had any questions during this video, make sure to write them down in your notebook and your notes so you can bring them up in class when I see you. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.